check out this shirt. Damn, I love frogs. I'm gonna take a wild guess and say you do too, cause you clicked on this video. So you must feel at least above neutral about frogs. I mean, how could you not? They're cute as fuck. Introducing some cute frogs is actually one of the first things I did when I started making TikToks in 2020. I think the first video was tardigrades, then it was some deep sea specimens, and then it was the frogs in this video. And that video did pretty well. Granted, I gave about like five seconds of information for each frog, so I decided it is time to present them in a slightly longer format, giving you a bit more than five seconds of information per frog. So sit back and relax while I introduce Introduce you to some frogs I think that you will like. Also, I finished the setup. Gotten a lot of comments about the base not being in the video anymore. It literally doesn't fit. This frame is way too fucking big, so got my little travel guitar here instead. Maybe the base will make an appearance in a later video now that we all have the same understanding that it it's it's not gonna look like it fits. So with that being said, let's get the general information out of the way. Frogs are amphibians, and as you probably know, amphibians notoriously need water. The word amphibian literally means living in both water and land. You can kind of think of them as the first group to emerge from the vertebrate transition from water to land. Remember the lobe-finned fish to tetrapods that we talked about a couple weeks ago? And so, not surprisingly, they still relied on the water for various aspects of their bodies and lifestyles. And even though some of these early tetrapods eventually evolved into forms that didn't really rely on water at all, this half and half lifestyle just so happened to be successful enough to survive and evolve in its own ways over hundreds of millions of years. One of these amphibious innovations was the frog form. The earliest record of the frog shape comes from an animal that was alive in the Triassic period called Triatobotrachus, alive about 250 million years ago. But the true frog group seems to have appeared much later than this, scientifically called a neuro, somewhere between 220 to 180 million years ago. And since then, frogs have evolved to live spread the fuck out at the tops of trees at high elevations, in desert sands, but all still rely on that precious water for their skin and other things. And that's not to say that other things don't rely on water. Obviously, everything alive relies on water in one way or another. Don't do an all lives need water in the comments, please. This video is about frogs only. The largest frog alive that we know of is the Goliath frog, which can get to about a foot long and weigh about seven pounds. And the largest to ever exist that we know of actually wasn't that much bigger, called Beals of Bufo, alive about 70 million years ago in what is now Madagascar. They got to about 16 inches long, and weighed about 10 pounds. So not crazy size, but still likely large enough to take down small little reptiles and maybe even baby dinosaurs alive during that time. So there seems to be some sort of restriction to the maximum frog size limit, but the minimum frog size limit is almost non-existent. I'm gonna have to shrink between the molecules to get in there. But I'm gonna save that for the end of the video because I wanna go in depth on the smallest frog to ever exist that we know of. What I would rather do right now, really quick, is a super quick general rundown of the frog life cycle. I know we learned this shit in like kindergarten, but it's easy to forget shit you learned in kindergarten because you look back and realize half the memories you have are made up, like a crazy dream you had about an elephant-sized spider that you thought was real but it wasn't. Or your imaginary friend named Max, who was some sort of bear cat that was like six feet tall and wore a red sweatshirt and a hat. <laughs> so let me just run through it real quick. So frogs generally reproduce via external fertilization, i.e. they do not bang. Generally, the female will release eggs into a body of water, then the male releases sperm to fertilize them, just tossing shit around, hoping for the best. And a lot of things can go wrong when you do that. So a popular solution in the frog community to increase accuracy is to get into a mating position called amplexus where the male piggybacks the female and fertilizes the eggs as she releases them. Males are usually small. They are the little guys. So they do the piggybacking. So the fertilized eggs are in the water, in numbers, in like the thousands, in a little egg clump that has this nutritious jelly to protect the eggs and also keep them moist. Kind of looks like chia pudding, but it's not. Do not eat it. No, I don't think I will. During this stage, their tail starts to develop. So if you can't tell the difference between a frog spawn and a chia pudding, chia seeds do not have tails. Okay. Then the eggs hatch into tadpoles and they get equipped quick with gills. The tail gets longer and stronger and the hind limbs start sprouting out. The lungs develop and then skin grows over the gills. Gills are donezo. After several weeks or a few months or so, the tadpoles develop into froglets. Yes, froglets is a real thing, and they are as cute as they sound. During this baby frog phase, they kind of hang out around land. Their tail shortens, their front and back limbs are fully formed, and they stay this way for a while until they develop into adult frogs. And this is all generally. This is like the general frog blueprint. There are always exceptions. I'm not speaking for all frogs, just the stereotypical frog. Also, real quick, you might've heard that frogs breathe through their skin. That's because they technically have three respiratory tools, their lungs that they use while bopping around on land, the lining of their mouth when they are resting, and their skin when they are fully submerged in water. That's why you might have also heard people talking about being careful when you handle frogs, or better yet, not handling them at all. Skin is very important for everything that has skin, of course, but they've got even more shit going on with their skin. So 
just be mindful of the frog's skin. All right, let's get into the frogs. Starting off with a fan favorite frog, the desert rain frog, found on the coast of South Africa and Namibia. They love sand, especially wet sand, because they are frogs. So they tend to be found in areas with a lot of sea fog, fog, not frog, which keeps the ground wet, makes the sand stick to them. Then the frogs can absorb the wet through their bellies. See fog for the frogs. Desert rain frogs are about two and a half inches long max, which is for reference about the size of a standard American billiard ball or even small. They use their short squat legs to dig through the wet sand and dig deeper to new wet sand if their sand dries out. And despite looking like a squeaky toy, they actually have a distinct bellow that has often been described as a warrior's call. extremely chilling and formidable. Another fan favorite frog is actually the cousin to the desert rain frog. It's the, you guessed it, black rain frog, also known as the avocado that had a bad day, the Eeyore of the rain frog genus. Rather than the sandy shores the desert rain frog calls home, the black rain frog prefers the shrublands of the western and eastern Cape provinces in South Africa. And I couldn't find any videos of what they sound like, but I'm gonna take a wild guess, say they probably sound like this. Alright, moving on to a whole different category of frog I think that you will like. The Amazon milk frog. For reasons I can't explain, they look very refreshing to me. You know? Like refreshing in a way a Baja Blast looks refreshing. Very thirst quenching. Like a beach in a video game. The Amazon milk frog is found in the Amazon rainforest. And get their other name, milk. Not because they are drinkable, unfortunately, but because they ooze a milk-like poisonous substance when threatened. Mm. <laughs> Nice. They spend the majority of their life in the trees. They got those big toe pads for climbing. And luckily, being a small little guy in the Amazon rainforest means it's fairly easy to find a tree cavity filled with water to conduct business in. Males will call out for the females in a water cavity on a clear night. <coughs> if he's lucky, the female will come, toss her eggs in, he'll fertilize them, and they dip. All right, the next one on our lineup is probably as alien as frogs can get, but still very cool. And I think that you will like them. The glass frogs. A family of tree frogs found in forests of Central and South America. And as their name suggests, some of the members of this family have a glassy appearance, i.e. translucent undersides. So much so that you can see their internal organs, which is nuts. They're one of, if not the only animals on land with this glassy characteristic that we know of. And this is obviously a great quality to have. I would say they're probably not the only ones because the other ones that probably exist have not been found yet because they look invisible. The translucency of the frog's undersides allows them to appear lighter or darker, depending on the shade of green the frog is set upon. And their legs have even more of a blending effect. The outline of the frog kind of becomes muddy, almost to the point where you have to know a frog is there to even start looking for it. This technique is known as edge diffusion, which is exactly how it sounds. The edges are diffused. Can't see shit. Can't see one thing standing out from another. It's not exactly camouflage, but more of a camouflage enhancement. This not only works for birds and other predators in the Amazon rainforest, but also humans too. In 2020, scientists had a group of people look at computer generated pictures of these glass frogs with varying levels of translucency and try to find the frogs as fast as possible. They had the hardest time with the frogs that had the same degree of translucency as the glass frogs. We are but another predator in the rainforest and we get fooled as well. This next one holds a very special place in my heart as it is the icon of Puerto Rico. Despite my appearance, I am half Puerto Rican. I know I don't look it, I also don't speak a lot of Spanish, but I have loved this frog since the first time I visited Puerto Rico when I was six. This frog I speak of is the coqui, named after the sounds of the male's calls, which sound like this. <coughs> Cute as fuck. So the co and the key are kind of done separately. The co more for establishing territory, kind of more directed at other males, keeping males out of their business, while the key attracts the ladies. There's 16 different species on the island and they all do these calls at different times of the day. And they are one to two inches long. They also have super big toe pads, which definitely adds to them being cute as fuck. And these help navigate the trees and plants they reside in. They're not really attached to water as much as their other frog brethren. They lay their eggs in the trees and on plant leaves and kind of got rid of the tadpole stage. They just hatch as a full on froglet. The most abundant species on this island by far is the common coqui. And when I say abundant, I mean abundant. The US Forest Service listed their estimated density at over 20,000 individuals per hectare, which is unfathomable. So at night you can hear their calls all over the island. And I don't mean like they're at a distance. I mean, they are right outside your window. They're accompanying you on your walk to the convenience store. And Puerto Ricans love it. It's a really cozy and nostalgic sound, especially for Puerto Ricans who grew up there and left. There's no other animal cherished as much as the coqui in Puerto Rico. Coquis elsewhere though is a different story. As you would expect from a small, abundant, and often elusive creature, the coquis have made it to a different island or group of islands. Yeah, 
Hawaii. They hitchhiked on plants all the way across the world to an island that is literally perfect for them. A lovely tropical climate with no natural competition or predators. And insects served on a silver platter to feast on. And Hawaii soon became Koki City. They took it the fuck over. With populations reaching 55,000 individuals per hectare in some areas. Double the density that they have in Puerto Rico. And Hawaiians do not like this. While some people have accepted the noise and have learned to drown it out, others describe the sound as deafening and infernally evil hellspawn that must be proactively and aggressively destroyed. The Hawaiian government describes it as a loud, incessant, and annoying call from dusk to dawn. They are, if you haven't guessed already, an invasive species there. I would love to hear your experience if you've been in an area with coquis like this, so let me know your opinion in the comments. And now, onto the tiniest frog in our lineup, who unfortunately doesn't have a common name yet, so I'm gonna leave it up to you. It's called Pitafrinia morensis, and Nat Geo called it a fly-sized beast, so maybe for now we're gonna call it the beast. The beast gets to about 7.7 .7 millimeters long on average, making it the smallest frog in the world that we know of, and also possibly the smallest vertebrate. But there is a male anglerfish, species Photocornus spinoseps, that is slightly smaller. I wanna say in the six to seven millimeter range, but it's just the male anglerfish. So I don't know if that really counts. They are at best a growth on the underside of a female. I guess technically that counts. I don't know, which really begs the question, what are these heinous mysteries of the deep that people fear about deep sea exploration? Seems like the animals are not so much bigger than you can imagine, but smaller than you can imagine. A six millimeter long fish, absolutely twisted. Anyway, back to the beast, which is very much on land, in wet leaf litter on the island of New Guinea. It seems as though they might have evolved to access the untapped meat market of mega small invertebrates that no one eats because they're too small, i.e. mites. The beast is very much capable of eating mites, and you know what? I'm happy for them. And I hope they make you ponder what other mega tiny animals are waiting to be discovered. Maybe there is one in the room with you right now. And before I end the video, I wanna to talk to you about a group I used to volunteer with when I was 19 called the Lovejoy Foundation. They're a no-kill animal shelter in Inglewood, California. I've known the owner, Erin Lovejoy, for as long as I can remember because I went to elementary school with her son, Cole, and she is a bad bitch. She's been running this foundation for almost 15 years now. I used to go there like three times a week to help out with behavior training for the dogs that were getting ready for adoption. And spending all that time there, Erin was a really inspiring voice for me early on in my journey to zoology. And right now they're having a really hard time feeding all the dogs. Donations aren't coming in as consistently as usual because a lot of people are having a hard time. So I wanted to spread the word here and see if you have the means, if you'd be down to donate or send them a bag of food or whatever you're capable of, any amount that's comfortable for you. This is not sponsored at all. I've kept up with them since I volunteered there and I really care about their mission and the dogs and want to use my platform to help spread the word. Aaron said the easiest thing right now for them to accept is Amazon wishlist donations. So I will put that link in the description. They have lots of stuff they need. They have like $16 bags of food that they said are the most necessary. So if you're able to help out, I would really appreciate it. And I know they would especially. One of the dogs that I really connected with there named Chase, I spent the most time with him. I wanted to adopt him, but I was 19 and I was living with my parents and I was in between one college and another. And I actually ended up helping adopt him out to a family in LA. And this was like eight years ago, I think. And I've kept up with them since. And whenever they go out of town, I watch him. And so Lovejoy Foundation has a very, very special place in my heart. So I appreciate it if you can help. They are amazing. Aaron is fucking amazing. So thank you. And if you liked this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next episode of the history of life on earth that we know of. Hopefully next week. But the research this time is unusually fucking nuts. So we'll see. Check out my Patreon for behind the scenes updates and my Discord server. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya!